Those of you who are streaming in, we will be beginning in a few minutes. Did you see where? shout too much. It's a large room. I feel like I need to project. My name is Jerry Friedman. I run my own law office. My biography of uh, note, I am a veterinary school dropout. Veterinary school, New Mexico State University, turned me vegan. And I got into law as, a, as an expression of activism. So I was an activist first and an attorney second. I have written articles in one way or another supporting animal rights and or veganism. I've been published in a cultural encyclopedia of vegetarianism, and I'm delighted to give this presentation today. The bring in the bring in the why meat eating did not cause the human brain to grow. So there have been some theories floating around recently that 
says that meat is what made us human, and my presentation is really emphasizing the role of speciesism in science. So I'll tie all these together. The issue came about for me when I heard this idea that meat eating caused the human brain to grow from getting this intuitive sense of, well, what other animals ate meat and had their brains grow? And we don't know that any Tyrannosaurus rexes, for example, who have developed any form of technology, radio, rockets, anything of a sort. And when we think about Tyrannosaurus rex, we do not think of cyborgs. From this intuitive sense of it doesn't, it doesn't seem to correlate that meat eating caused the human brain to grow, that's where I started to do my own research, my independent research, and, and uh, plunge into it. But the popular opinion, scientific as it may not be, is represented here by Lear Heath, the author of The Vegetarian Myth. She attacks vegetarianism. She says in an interview, you can go back four million years to the very beginning of the human race, which was actually about two and a half million years ago, and there is no question that we were hunters. There is plenty of questions. This is what we ate for literally four million years, which is not correct, and it's the reason why we have really big brains. So this is fundamentally the popular opinion that if it weren't for eating meat, humans would still be chimpanzees and bongos and, and monkeys, monkeys and apes running around in Africa, and it is this responsibility to our ancestors, it's this duty to eating meat that we have a very, a very large brains. It's, it's saying that in order to support our ancestors, we have to keep eating meat. So there's this implicit pro-meat argument in here. The underlying, the underlying philosophy where I'm coming from, we see the large circle is anthropocentrism. And anthropocentrism, in a sentence, is that only the human perspective matters. Inside of that circle, we have speciesism, which in a sentence means that human interests trump the interests of other animals. And finally, carnism in the middle center, in the middle circle, is uh, that humans should eat other animals. So when we take these paradigms, particularly speciesism, but carnism as well, and we inject them into science, we get people like Aristotle, in a sentence, my summary, he did not say this, my summary is, lower life forms were created to serve humans. So remember that Aristotle created the great chain of being with gods and angels on top, humans in the middle, and all the other animals below. Rene Descartes, a vivisector, one of the first vivisectors, in a sentence, his idea was that only human suffering is morally relevant. So when he would be dissecting dogs and cats, alive and they would be screaming, he would acknowledge that they suffer, but that their suffering is more mechanical, like the ticking clock. Their suffering doesn't really mean what it means for humans. And then finally I have here Raymond Dart. He's one of the pioneers of paleoanthropology. And his position summarized is that humans became civilized by hunting and eating other animals. So my presentation is really focused on the legacy of Raymond Dart, how later generations of anthropologists have used his assumptions and infused that with the evolution of humans. Let me give you some science background. This is Plesiadipus, and if nobody recognizes her, she is your ancestor. 55 million years ago, that's your grandma. She fed on fruits and leaves and some insects, not many. Actually, at this time, our ancestors were moving away from an insect diet and into a flower and fruit and leaf diet 55 million years ago. So on the left, we have, again, 55 million years ago, here's Plesiadipus, and we have a very, very, very long time of eating fruits and leaves. We get to our common ancestor with orangutans, who eat fruit, leaves, grass. We go to gorillas, 9 million years ago, they eat fruit, leaves, and we have chimpanzees and bonobos, they eat fruits and leaves. So we have been evolving as plant eaters at least up to this point, six million years ago, and actually later. So changing the scale, now we've got six million years on the left. We have chimpanzees with a brain size of 350 cubic centimeters. Australopithecines, at 450 cubic centimeters, their brain grew 29%. So already, 
around four or five million years ago, we've got some 29% brain growth. Here at 3.4 million years ago, we have the very first evidence of stone tools that are believed to be um, used for carving uh, meat off the bones. This is our very first evidence. We don't have any more evidence until the scavenging point be here about 2.2 million years ago. In between, we have Homo habilis, 800 cubic centimeter brain, 129% growth from chimpanzees. We have Homo erectus, 1,100 cubic centimeters, 214% growth. And then we have Neanderthals and actually modern humans are going to be up here as well. 1,500 cubic centimeter brain, 329% growth from chimpanzees. And so what inspired some of these earliest paleoanthropologists is that they look, they look at where immediately we have stone tools here, we have durable fossil evidence here, we have evidence here, we have controlled fire here, we have spears, and as we presume our ancestors are eating more and more meat, well, look at that, our brain is getting bigger and bigger on this correlation line. Remember that correlation does not imply causation. There's a lot of things that correlate that don't show a correlation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Another short scale, we have uh, the point six million years ago, or 600,000 million years ago. We have spears at 500,000 years ago. We have Homo erectus again, Neanderthals again. We have humans going up to archaic humans at 1,500 cubic centimeters. We peak around 20,000 years ago, and then we shrink a little bit, which is an interesting thing to talk about. And our brain is 286% the size of chimpanzees. Also over here, 50,000 years ago, we began full-scale hunting. So we know we have a little bit of meat-eating. Spears could be offensive or defensive. We have a little bit of meat-eating, not very much, but all the way over here is when we really start eating meat. And 10,000 years ago is when we start agriculture. This will be the grains and farming and so forth. Okay, with that background, let me tell you what the experts are saying. This is Henry Bunn. He says, meat made us human talks about specifically hunting and how the uh, development of tools to, to process meat made us human. Leslie Aiello, one of the authors of the Expensive Tissue Hypothesis, said the incorporation of increasingly greater amounts of animal products into the diet was essential in the evolution of the large human brain. And Catherine Melton Without meat, it's unlikely that protohumans, which are the earliest humans, protohumans, could have secured enough energy and nutrition from the plants available in their African environment at that time to evolve into the active, social, intelligent creatures they became. became. So she's actually talking about the climate change that took place in Africa. There were fewer plant resources, and so she believes that if it wasn't for meat, the plant resources would not have been enough to support a large brain. All right, let's go to physical evidence. Physical evidence is focused on two issues. The first is theoretical. We have man the hunter hypothesis. The man the hunter hypothesis says simply that the better the hunter, the more meat they'll bring, and they'll get a larger brain, because hunting presumably takes communication, planning, strategy, cooperation. The larger brain then comes back around, makes you a better hunter, and the circle continues. And so there's a reward system, positive feedback loop. The better you are hunting, the better you feed your children, the more your children will be likely to survive, and their offspring will carry your large brain genes. Comparatively, our ancestors supposedly who were vegetarians, they didn't get that benefit, and they died off. So that's the man hunter hypothesis. This hypothesis has fallen into disfavor for a few reasons, mostly because of the way the brain grew. So if you think about birds, when birds are evolving their wings, their wings will grow only to the size they need to grow. They're not going to grow bigger. You have to justify the growth of the wing with the energy consumption. The same thing with every organ in the body. So the function of the organ relates directly to its utility to the body. But the function of the brain, the frontal lobe, grew most in absolute terms and in relation to the rest of the brain. So what does the frontal lobe do for us? It's good for planning and problem solving, sensory interpretation, our, our five senses, and a more sophisticated understanding of the world. Would this help in hunting? Sure, it would help in a lot of things, not just hunting. Why is only hunting getting credit when this kind of brain growth would improve so many different things? Uh, 
Broca's, the Broca's area, which is in the front left here, is where language starts. The idea that we develop language only to help hunting is silly. We develop language for a great number of things. Robert Sussman said Australopithecines didn't have the tools, didn't have the big teeth, and was three feet tall. He was using his brain, his agility, and social skills to get away from predators. Another view, which is more prominent now, is that our brain was developed not to hunt, but to avoid being hunted. What Robert Sussman and his co-researcher Donna Hart discovered is the, uh, the predation rate against our ancestors dropped as the brain was growing. So at a certain point, fewer of our ancestors were being killed and the brain was expanding. What can we infer from this? We can infer that our ancestors were getting smarter and they were avoiding predators. The direct physical evidence uh, focuses, this is Henry Bunn's work, focuses on relics found at the Old Abide Gorge around two million years ago. The, the bones came from a minimum of 48 large animals. We don't know how many animals, but we're, we'll estimate 50. And they accumulated over several years. How long is several years? Well, let's say five. You can massage the numbers a little bit. But if you calculate these out, that means you're getting about 10 large animals per year. If you can imagine a group of people eating 10 large animals per year, that's not significant for your whole diet. These bones, they have offered no evidence of universal, universality. What I mean by that is we have one site. We don't know if other sites were like this. We don't know if this particular group of ancestors was like everybody else, or maybe they were unusual. We don't know what the meat yield was. When you see bones with scratches on it, we don't know if they were hunted or scavenged. We don't know uh, how much each, each leg or body part yielded for meat. We don't know that because we don't even know how many people, how many of our ancestors were there. If there was a human population of 25 to 50, which is assumed to be average, maybe it was a smaller group of 10, which means there would be more meat for them. Maybe it was a larger group, maybe several bands of our ancestors occupied this site, so we don't know how much they ate. We don't know what kind of competition with scavengers or how much was lost to decay. They didn't have salting, they didn't have smoking, they didn't have refrigerators. So if they had a large animal, how often could they eat from that large animal before the large animal was, was poisonous? And most importantly, we don't have evidence of their whole diet. The problem with the fossils and the stone tools, they preserved very well over the millions of years. But we don't know what kind of fruits, what kind of tubers, what kind of honey, what other things they ate because they didn't fossilize. And so trying to calculate how much meat our ancestors ate and how that affected brain growth without understanding the whole diet, it's an incomplete calculation. It's little better than an assumption. There's also no discussion of other period tools. We know that uh, it's believed that the first tools that our ancestors were using may have been slings. For example, if you have a sling around your shoulder, you can carry a baby, or if you have a sling around your shoulder, you can gather more fruits and, uh, other, and other, other plant foods. And so there's this inordinate uh, emphasis on the stone and bones because they preserve so well, and there's no discussion about any other technology at the time. Ironically, I think, uh, a few years after Bunn published, he gave a presentation, and uh, in his presentation he said that uh, he believes these early humans probably sat in trees and waited until herds of antelopes or gazelles passed below, and then speared them at point-blank range. So this is a very powerful man-the-hunter uh, hypothesis. What's the problem with this? Well, spears were not discovered in the area, which he admits there were no spears. Okay, so it's speculation, that's fine but they weren't even discovered for many, many years. So his, his discovery, his argument, says that uh, two million years ago we had spears, but spears weren't discovered actually uh, 1.5 million years later. So he's making this stuff up. At the same time, he create, criticizes other researchers for not being able to pr produce, for example, wooden digging tools. And so if our ancestors may have eaten tubers, which are deep underground, we assume they had wooden digging tools to dig them up. Well, this guy says, well, we don't have any wooden digging tools, so why do you have such an idea? And so here he's given a double standard. Another suggestion of Bunn is that uh, our ancestors' hominins could have uh, power scavenged, which means that uh, lions or hyenas may have killed some animal, and then our ancestors scared them away some way, somehow. He does not uh, give equal consideration to power scavenging from pigs. Pigs, in the time, are known to eat tubers. 
It could be very easily speculated that, that uh, the pigs would have dug these tubers up and that our ancestors could have scared the pigs away. Tubers uh, would have provided a lot more calories, a lot more nutrition, they preserve better, and there's less competition. I don't know if anyone here, if you would rather try to chase a lion away from a gazelle or if you'd rather chase a, a pig away from a tuber. So, a lot less dangerous. All right. There's also been some chemical analyses. There was one particular set of Australopithecine bones, Australopithecines being our very, very ancient ancestors. And in the Australopithecine bones, there were some chemical markers for grass. But the teeth of these Australopithecines didn't show any wear patterns on the teeth that, that they would have expected. So the researcher, the researcher assumed that having grass in your bones but no grass evidence in your teeth means you must have eaten cows and other animals who ate grass. So you were eating meat and grass eating animals. And voila, our Australopithecine ancestors must have been successful hunters eating hippopotami and water buffalo and so forth. So the problems with this uh, line of reasoning are that uh, our Australopithecine relatives had very large uh, had, had very large colon, which we know because they had conical ribs. So right now, your ribs, if you stand up, your ribs are cylindrical. You could run straight lines down the other side. But with the Australopithecines, they branch out at the bottom. They branch out at the bottom too for a large colon. And why would they have a large colon? Because that's where their where grass would be fermenting. The same thing with horses. Horses have a large colon because they ferment in the hind gut, behind the stomach. The same thing with uh, other primates and so forth. So we know that they ate grass because they had a large colon. Also, another thing that could have contributed to the markers in, in their uh, in their bones is because they probably ate sedges and uh, particularly tiger nuts. These are grass-like plants that are extremely nutritious. And if they ate the if they ate the, the roots, it would not show the rare patterns of grass. So there are other examples. There are other explanations for these things that these researchers do not, they do not venture down. And uh, the question, of course, is why. If they're scholars, they should be thinking these things. There was another case of uh, misapplied chemical analyses in 2000. There were some Neanderthals whose bones were analyzed, which showed very high protein content. And everybody thought, look at that, Neanderthals. They were terrific hunters. Maybe they only ate meat. Very high protein content in their bones. But uh, 10 years later, 2010, 12 years later, 2012, uh, they studied the dental plaque of Neanderthals, which is not what I imagine most people went to school thinking they would do, but they studied the dental plaque and they found a lot of plant, a lot of plant cells. They found seeds and uh, other, other plant materials in the plaque, much, much more than any lipids, any fat from meat. The, uh, the head researcher, Allison Brooks, said that we've tended to assume that if you had very high value for protein in the diet, that must have come from meat, but it's possible that some of the protein in the diet is coming from plants. So here again, we have an assumption that Neanderthals must have been these savage meat eaters, but maybe they actually ate vegetables. Also, I have here as a small note the extinction. I went to a presentation by Donald Johansson, which is a very famous paleontologist, and he made it apparent, he made clear to the entire audience that a lot of species of vegetarian humans, our ancestors, died out. They were vegetarians. What does that mean? Well, I should have brought up to him that Neanderthals, who were thought to be savage meat eaters at the time, well, they died out too. Again, we have this inherent bias in paleoanthropology. Physiological evidence. The expensive tissue hypothesis right now is the leading hypothesis on meat and brain growth. It says that our ancestors, all, all apes actually, our ancestors, had a small brain and a large gut. And the brain and the gut, they use about the same amount of energy. As the human brain grew, the gut shrank by the same amount, and that balanced the energy needs. But what's the problem with a small gut? You cannot absorb as many calories with a small gut as you can with a large gut. You have less surface area. So what's the solution? Well, they must have eaten meat. They had to have eaten more caloric food. There's actually uh, at least three sources for more calories. There's meat, of course, that's source one. There are underground uh, uh, storage organs, tubers, yams, and so forth, and cooked food, cooked food of either, of either type. So what did the researchers conclude without giving any explanation? Oh, it was me. All right. Expensive tissue hypothesis also did not consider a third variable. The third variable is that if the whole gut shrank, well, the gut is composed of two organs, the large intestine, and small intestine, and they could have changed their ratios. The ratios and for example, we have uh, four million years ago, we have a 
brain and gut dimension here, and you see how, as the brain grew, the gut shrank. But if you consider the third variable, if you consider that the gut is two separate organs, and if you look at how they may have changed dimensions, you can see that the small intestine actually could have grown while the colon shrank quite a bit. And this is something that Catherine Milton points out. Also, another criticism is that our brain is composed of a lot of fat. If you look at our absolute brain growth, sure, it got really big, but if you take all the fat out of it, in other words, if you just measure the neurons, it didn't grow by the proportions that they say in the expensive tissue hypothesis. The quote here from Anna Navarrete, contrary to predictions of the expensive tissue hypothesis, we found no negative correlations between the relative size of the brain and the digestive tract. All right, the last physiological argument is that uh, babies, human babies, have an explosive brain growth from the age of birth to about five years, and Catherine Milton believes that the only way that you can get essential fatty acids, which is extremely important in brain growth, is to eat meat. But again, we have several sources. We have meat, of course. We have algae. How do we know that our ancestors ate algae? Richard Wrangham from Harvard says that our ancestors probably ate plants that grew along lakes and rivers, and we can infer that those plants had algae on them. And other plants, for example, the, uh, the sedges, the, uh, the grasses that had uh, essential fatty acids. But what did Catherine Milton conclude without much explanation? Uh, must have been meat. Okay, general contradictions. I know I'm short on time, so I'll go through pretty quickly. One of the interesting facts about this is that as meat consumption has been increasing with humans, as you saw earlier, 20,000 years ago, our brain started to shrink. And so what explanation could there be that says if you eat a lot of meat, your brain grows, but if you eat a little bit more, it'll shrink? You would assume that if we kept up eating meat, it should keep growing, or at least it should level off. It should not shrink, but we lost the size of the tennis ball. If you want to talk about correlation, remember that correlation does not imply causation, but if you want to talk correlation, meat eaters generally do not have a large brain. Lion's ratio of brain to body is 0.8, spotted hyena 0.4, gray wolf 0.3, grizzly bear 0.004. These numbers are not impressive, but when we look at our ancient ancestors, their brain to body ratio is 2.2, and the modern human is around 0.7, 7.5. And so if you're looking at a correlation, the all the correlations that have come so far do not take into account that meat eaters generally do not have a large brain. The Texas sharpshooter fallacy, uh, unfortunately I won't go into very much, but uh, suffice to say, you can look that up, suffice to say that spider monkeys prefer fruit, they have a very close relative, a howler monkey may prefer leaves, and the spider monkey brain grew twice as big. So how does a spider monkey grow a brain twice as big as their cousin by eating a lot of fruit? Where's the meat, right? You can also look at chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees hunt and they, oh, good. <laughs> chimpanzees hunt, they eat meat, uh, but their brain is the same size as bonobos who are pretty meat averse. There have been a few reports of bonobo, bonobos eating meat, but it's extremely unusual in a bonobo diet. So why did hunting and eating meat not help the chimpanzee brain to grow? Conclusions, the burden of proof is on the affirmative. By this, all of these theories of other scientists they're trying to prove something and they have to prove it. I don't have to prove anything. I'm just proving that they're wrong. I don't have to prove anything in the affirmative. I'm not making the affirmative. They're making the affirmative case. Correlation does not imply a causation. If in doubt, if you insist on using correlation, predators and carnivores do not correlate to large brains. There's no mechanism that's suggested as to how this actually works. There's no evidence of the relationship between the history of hunting and brain growth. This is speculation with no evidence. There is no evidence of the amount of meat in our ancestors' diet. So how do you say what food they ate that would have caused their brain to grow if you don't know what food they ate? Combined, when meat has been most available, the human brain has been shrinking. Brain growth, gut shrinkage, and lengthening of the small intestine are explained by high-calorie food of any source and carbohydrates are the better candidate. Finally, the areas of the brain that grew correspond to social skills, of which foraging behaviors are one social skill, of which eating meat is one foraging behavior, hunting and eating meat. I will conclude with one of my favorite quotes, Richard Leakey, Jr. He says, all scientists work from some kind of theoretical framework and interpret evidence in its light. Weak evidence can often be made to fit such a framework, whatever its form. I've seen that happen many times in paleoanthropology today. So ultimately, I hope I've shown that the
speciesism coming down from Raymond Dart maybe as far back as Aristotle uh, is alive and well in science, and I hope that everybody who considers these things keeps an open and critical mind, puts the burden of proof on the person who makes the affirmative statement, and uh, just be skeptical, be, be doubtful. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. It was a nice takedown of the argument. Um, next up is Stephanie Astrover, Associate Professor of um, Rhetorics of Science, Technology, and Culture um, in the Department of English at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. All right, Wisconsin. Um, with the paper Recycling Motor, <coughs> the Ethos of Taxidermy Art. And I ask if you could give a small bio. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that introduction. I um, actually lived in Houston for five years, so it's nice to be back. And uh, I, um, relevant to my presentation today, is a um, is an interest in representation of animals um, among uh, photographers who are photographing in natural history museums. And uh, what I begin to see is a, that there's a lot of um, uh, work that is taking them into, uh, you know, taxidermy and uh, archives, and I became fascinated with the um, uh, the layering of that kind of representation, where um, you know you've got the, uh, the the animal skin and the and the, the lens of the photograph, and uh, I, I started to to photograph some of or so talk to some of those photographers, and then I started to. Uh, uh, also talk to um, uh, some artists who are working with uh, animal skins or resourced taxidermy pieces in their own artwork. And at that point, I uh, curated a show on my campus with a uh, collaborator in art and design and brought some of these um, artists to, to campus. And we had a lively discussion um, about what is the what what is going on with this work? So what I'm doing right now is trying to log into an application called Storify, which is um, uh, I, I I agreed with my students uh, for my students that I would use this application because they had to learn it and so did I. And so I said I'll do my conference presentation in Storify. So what this is basically is a uh, social media. Um, tool. It curates social media and it doesn't really lend itself too well to academic presentations. I use PowerPoint all the time and so this has limited me a little bit. But I think what you can see is um, what I've got going on here uh, in text and some of the images. And if I have some time, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to link out and show you a little bit more of what I wasn't able to embed via the social media. So I'm going to read a little bit and show a little bit and maybe make some comments in between. Taxidermy, the art and science of using the skins of dead animals to make them look alive again, has always had an expressive mode apart from the creation of true to life natural history artifacts and hunting trophies. Outside the museum and hunting lodge, two noteworthy Victorian era examples are taxidermy hobbyists Walter Potter's anthropomorphic tableaus, think kittens at tea, and rabbits in math class, and P.T. Barnum's monkey head fishtail uh, fabrication that he called the Fiji mermaid that was then copied endlessly in slideshows all across the, the U.S. in the early 20th century. These and other less famous examples of playful taxidermy inhabit a recognizable niche in visual material culture. Even when taxidermy is intentionally botched, to use art historian Steve Baker's term, or downright crappy, as visual blogger Kat Sue describes it, we know taxidermy when we see it. And uh, I would recommend to you the uh, crappy taxidermy site, um, primarily because what she's doing here is some interesting historical archival work where she's photographing um, oftentimes just really bad taxidermy where uh, the skill just wasn't um, adequate to, to portray the animal in a naturalistic way. But you also see examples, like here's a, a pretty tatty uh, example, um, you also see examples of anthropomorphic taxidermy and you know uh, 
uh, hybrid creations, fantastic beasts, and, and, and so forth. And uh, this, is a, a, this blog has a lot of traffic among some of the artists that, that I talk about. The undeniable realness of animal fur, feathers, or bones has intrinsic ethos, I'm arguing. It's this insistent physical presence that seems to proclaim, I once was living. Yet, the dead animal has been made into an object. The fascination with taxidermy and other forms of preserving dead animals resides here at the crux of the dead animal object's insistent truth claim to be what it once was and its transformation into a human artifact layer of cultural meanings. So the animal remains an animal and at the same time it becomes a human artifact that has meanings that have nothing to do with the animal or very little to do with the animal. To some extent, the aesthetics of any sort of animal representation draws on the intrinsic ethos of the real animal. Um, there was a, uh, in a panel I was at, uh, before lunch, there was a cave painting that was one of the first slides. And the, the drama and, and the realness of even this, what we might consider to be a primitive or proto-art, is, is undeniable. You know, there's, a, there's a, an aliveness to that kind of representation that makes us think of the real animal. In this view, all living things have an indwelling value that arises from the simple fact that they are alive. So, it could be argued that an artist's naturalistic representation of a living thing is all the more credible, the more realistic it is. While the golden age of natural history taxidermy is now, for very good reasons, over and done with, museum visitors still marvel at the craftsmanship of such works as Carl Aikman's African Elephant Exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History, and competitors still buy for awards for work that is both realistic and creative at the annual World Taxidermy Championship. You don't see a heck of a lot of botched or uh, uh, rogue taxidermy at the World Taxidermy Championship. The realness aesthetic is very much um, uh, the prevalent aesthetic. But when the particular kind of naturalistic representation that is taxidermy deviates from the realism of the world, this reaction is, of course, the premise for Katsu's crappy taxidermy website. Once we get past the shabby wildcats and foxes striking anatomically impossible poses or tired of the anthropomorphic cuteness of Walter, Walter Potter's studious bunnies, we may well wonder how those real creatures that were made to look silly or charming came to such a pass. Were Potter's rabbits, like Aigley's elephants, killed to be made into dead animal objects perpetually subject to the human gaze? And this is the question that icks people out when they think about taxidermy now. Um, did they kill that animal to make that thing? And uh, what I'm going to show here is that that isn't happening in much of the contemporary taxidermy art that I've been looking at. Where indeed do the dead animals come from that are made into taxidermy art these days? In light of the complex state, federal, and international legal framework protecting wildlife and regulating the use of animal bodies that has arisen since Potter's and Aigley's times, it's intriguing that more artists than ever before seem to be using dead animals and parts of dead animals, by which I also mean dead birds, dead fish, dead reptiles, and dead insects, to make art. Further, in view of increasing concern about species loss, more and better research on animal behavior, cognition, and effective states, and promising measures to improve domestic animal welfare, the proliferation of taxidermy and other animal preservation methods to make dead animal art suggests to me and others who are also writing about this phenomenon that something both naturally and culturally significant is a foot, a hoof, a fin, and a claw here. These two dilemmas, the competing ethos of the once living animal body and its representation as a cultural object, and the conflict between a practical concern for animal welfare and an aesthetic engagement with real animal bodies, makes me ask, how do contemporary artists using dead animals to make art establish ethos? How, in other words, do they explain and justify their representation of dead animals, their sourcing of animal bodies, and their participation in the larger economies of animals as visual and material capital. A brief look at a larger trend of using animals in art suggests some possible boundaries of what viewers consider tolerable. 
and a close examination of taxidermy artists' statements about their work reveals a complex conversation within these boundaries about our problematic but ultimately hopeful relationship with the natural world. By contemporary standards, using animals, whether dead or alive, to make art tends to make people uneasy. On the high art end of the spectrum, for example, think of the controversy over British artist Damien Hirst's use of a preserved tiger shark in his 1991 piece, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. And this piece uh, um, was uh, commissioned by Damien Hirst. Um, this this uh, shark was uh, commissioned to be killed for this work. Um, consider also Eduardo Katz's 2000 piece GFP Bunny, a transgenic artwork consisting of a live albino rabbit, altered by a green fluorescent protein, who was intended, the artist claimed, to start a public dialogue on the important social issues surrounding genetics that are affecting and will affect everyone's lives for decades to come. So there's Alba, the, the animal that was created to make this conversation happen. Whereas Hearst commissioned an animal to be killed for his work, Katz arranged for an animal to be brought to life. Regardless of the artist's respective aims and audiences for these works, it is the life and death intentionality in the use of the animal, more than using an animal to make art in the first place, that makes these pieces so controversial. And to be sure, these were our, oh, not the only instances of such work. Um, here, for someone perusing the piece um, at their leisure, is a, uh, an article to the Huffington Post showcasing some of these artworks. The artworks described in this article, including tattooing live pigs, tossing freaked out cats down stairways, and cooking dead rats to feed to exhibition guests, are ethically dubious, regardless of the artist's justifications. Yet something in Laura Jin's artist statement, we will feast again on what we catch, which is actually more of a dynamic experience and a static piece, um, uh, captures my imagination here. She states that she is imagining a dystopian future in which urban survival will depend upon taking advantage of available resources. Um, this uh, dystopic vision of the world irreparably altered by the concentration of global capital with its attendant threats of climate change and species loss is refracted in many artworks that, like Jen's, propose local remedies to wide-scale human rot animal woes. Uh, considering trash animals like rats for food, for example, or developing forgotten skills like tanning hides to turn another sort of animal trash roadkill into something useful. These are a couple of examples of the manifestation of that kind of um, DIY uh, um, post-apocalyptic vision. Roadkill, in fact, is a prime source of animal bodies for many taxidermy artists, and they situate roadkill within an animal economy characterized by a reduce, reuse, recycle ethic. Serena Brewer, for example, one of the founding members of the loose-knit affiliation of taxidermy artists known as the Minnesota Association of Road Taxidermists, writes in her artist statement that, none of the animals used in my work were killed for the purpose of using them in my art. All animal components are recycled. I utilize salvaged roadkill and discarded livestock, as well as the many animal materials that are donated to me. Donated animals are often casualties of the pet trade, destroyed nuisance animals, or animals that die of natural causes. A very strict waste not, want not policy is adhered to in my studio. Virtually every part of the animal is recycled in some manner. And one of the things I do in the longer version of this talk is, for the paper version of this talk, is you know, I look at you know, such things as the use of passive voice in describing what is happening in this, in this artist's um, studio. It's kind of interesting that there is that kind of distancing, um, even though there is this embrace of um, uh, what cons that many would consider to be a legitimate uh, sort of uh, rationale. Well, it's not difficult, well, it's not especially pleasant to think about. We see roadkill all the time. There's no dearth of dead and mangled animal bodies dotting our streets and highways. And who among us does not wince, yet at the same time feel uh, some small relief upon, relief upon seeing a crow or some other carrion eater feasting on the remains. At least someone is getting a lunch out of this mishap, we might think. Unlike running across the carcass of an animal in the woods that has died a natural death, encountering roadkill reminds us that the human-made world, which is really our only world since it's where we spend the vast majority of our lives, is not an animal-friendly world. 
It is rather a world in which our relations with animals, whether alive or dead, are highly prescribed. They are food, they are vermin, they are clothing, they are uh, pets, and perhaps, too, they are art. Um, from the carcass in the woods, we might be tempted to take home a feather or some antlers as a remembrance of the encounter. This same urge to memorialize the dead animal, to participate somehow in that animal other's life and death experience, is also at work in taxidermy artists' recycling of roadkill. As with the recycling of manufactured goods, like tires, ball caps, keyboards, and so on, to make art or to make useful uh, uh, home decor and so forth, in recycled roadkill, the form of the original thing is reinterpreted sometimes necessarily due to the remains um, that are found. Taxidermy artist Simone Smith touches on the pathos of the roadkill encounter and the memorializing impulse when she writes, When I moved from the high desert of Southern California to the redwoods of Northern California, I began to encounter large amounts of animal casualties on the streets and highways. I started to take a closer look at the animals, some of which I've never seen up close before. Their last poses were grotesque yet beautiful. I knew these animals would remain in the streets, repeatedly being run over until someone came to scrape them up and throw them away. My fascination evolved from photographing these animals to eventually taking them home with me. It was on my dining room table that one day I decided to start preserving these animals and giving them a new life, one that would make them immortal. And when I found out that Steve Baker, who has written about uh, animal representation uh, uh, in some very significantly influential ways, when I found out that on his bike trips he started to photograph roadkill, I said, Steve, you know where this is heading, don't you? Smith, who's also affiliated with the Minnesota Association of Road Tacidermists, recycles all parts of the roadkill she finds, making jewelry, hair fasteners, and anthropomorphic dioramas. Like many taxidermy artists, her work is at times whimsical, reflecting a Victorian or steampunk aesthetic. And also, like many of these artists, her work reflects a collector sensibility, extending to cabinet of curiosity style displays. So there's something kind of retro about this work in the sense that it's harking back to uh, a pre-modernist time of um, uh, collecting and uh, putting uh, collections together in uh, taxonomically um, in correct ways, if you will, uh, for the sheer um, joy of looking at them. And, and, you know, a lot of people do this when we beach comb or when we, you know, uh, collect rocks or whatever it is that we do. So I'm trying to make this connection between a kind of human impulse to interact with the natural world and the physical, um, you know, vestiges of animals or uh, the, the lives that they live and what these taxidermy artists are doing. Noteworthy is the contemporary ethos of good citizenship via recycling uh, and how it runs parallel with this pre-modern intermingling of art and science. Daisy Tainton, a former insect preparator at the American Museum of Natural History, now makes art with dead insects. And her artist statement emphasizes the same sort of attention to ethical sourcing uh, that one might read on a Portlandian restaurant menu. I found this to be a, a little bit amusing. I love insect jewelry, she writes, because it showcases nature's beauty and bounty. And I feel good about using beetles that were farm-raised instead of harvested wild. This way, they get to live their full lives in peace and then live on as exquisite adornments and loving homes. And so we see that there is this kind of rhetoric of the right use of animal bodies that, that touches on uh, the, you know, the, the cultural mores around uh, uh, right sourcing, uh, um, ethical uh, harvesting, and, and so forth. Tainton is also one of the artists associated with uh, the, the mark, the Minnesota group, and then Morbid Anatomy, Tax, uh, Anatomy Museum in Brooklyn, New York which has as its mission statement that it is dedicated to the preservation, celebration, and exhibition of artifacts and ideas which fall between the cracks of high and low culture, art and craft, death and beauty, art and science. Morbid Anatomy too fosters an experiential aspect of taxidermy art. In this kind of art space, viewers become doers, learning the craft of taxidermy and other methods of preparing and displaying natural history artifacts. 
these old things seen anew and found things deemed renewable are being appropriated and reappropriated in ways that are best understood as social dramas enacting our ambivalence over a material culture in which intrinsic worth is overridden by commodity value. Robert Marbury, a curator of taxidermy art and author of the forthcoming book, Rome's Guide to Taxidermy, Art, Culture, and Doing It Yourself, emphasizes the importance of recognizing the procedural or experiential aspect of this work, that is, how artists are making it and what they are saying about making it. Um, how, to be more precise, the making of the work is itself a kind of statement about the work. Another example is uh, artist Nate Hill's Chinatown Garbage Taxidermy Tours, um, in which participants scavenge in dumpsters for food animal waste that they then reclaim and make into art. Marbury writes that art as we know is pretty wasteful and that we have to think about that. And I'm thinking here that we've been talking a little bit at this conference about um, waste and how that becomes uh, something that uh, we want to reclaim or redeem somehow, like uh, composting, for example. So let me just finish with this last paragraph, and then if there's any additional time, I can show a couple more images. Damien Hirst's work notwithstanding, a lot of artists working with dead animals are thinking plenty about uh, just what is waste and how their work with animals might somehow offset that waste. Therein resides its ethos. Artist and curator Mark Dion touches on the oppositional values involved in this task and is opening to notes toward a manifesto for artists working with or about the living world. We are not, he writes, simple, living in a simple age, and as artists of the time, our work reveals complex contradictions between science and art, between empiricism and the idea, between nature and technology, and between aesthetic conventions and novel forms of visualization. We are not apart from nature, but of it, as Diane reminds us. And recycling roadkill is, in some small measure, an accounting of that. So, um, do I have any extra time I could show? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. I could probably show you um, some work from Daisy Tainton that uh, I think will illustrate a little bit more about the um, <coughs> The Natural History Museum frame of reference, what she does is create dioramas. I don't know if I can make this any larger, but I can, can try to blow this up a little bit and show you. It's, uh, it's whimsy. It's, um, it's uh, uh, highly uh, uh, DIY. You can see that the, the, these little furniture items have been fabricated out of uh, maybe doll furniture or what have you. And it's beetles, you know. So um, she's able to take her knowledge and interest of insectology and, and uh, apply it in this uh, very whimsical way. But I think it's important to, to uh, reflect on what um, uh, an important artist like Mark Dion has to say about the sourcing, about the intentionality, about what artists are trying to do, because we have a very ambivalent and contradictory relationship with the natural world that we're trying through various practices to explain, to maybe grow, uh, you know, a better understanding of, and uh, I'd like to think that, that this work is, is also doing some of that. So thank you. I'm going to 
going to be talking about um, language representations of uh, non-human animals used for food in media. Um, and I'm a professor of Arab culture and media, and um, I'm also interested in uh, representation of, uh, uh, representations of animals. I met my, my co-author, Nouria Almiron, at a media conference last year, and we decided to collaborate on this project. The 2009 episode Deal Breakers talk show from the American satirical sitcom 30 Rock gave us a telling quick about how often print media spares its readership the truth. Kid writer Liz Lemon, played by Tina Fey, has unexpectedly fallen victim to panic after getting her own talk show. Network executive Jack Donaghy, played by Alec Baldwin, is coached by Jenna Maroney how to deal with Lemon's insecurities. You've created two Liz's, writer Liz and performer Liz. Performers need to be coddled to be protected from the real world, says Jenna. I get it, says Jack Donaghy. I must treat her like the New York Times treats its readers. When it comes to the question of non-human animals used for food, does the New York Times and other global media protect their readership from the truth? Or do they serve as a forum uh, for the public access to the truth? In other words, is global media upholding the ideologies of speciesism and carnism by making them invisible, or is global media challenging these ideologies and making them apparent? The question of non-human animals used for food is a very sensitive one. As Peter Singer has said, the media coverage of non-human animals is dominated by human interest events, like baby gorilla births at the zoo, but developments in farming techniques that deprive millions of animals freedom of movement go unreported. And primarily this is because the coverage of uh, non-human animals used for food in media is so neglected because of the twin ideologies of speciesism, oppression based on belonging to a species and carnism, the religion of meat eating. Stories about non-human animals in global media have two critical features. First, they systematically appeal to readers' fears. Second, they carefully reassure readers that nothing has damaged the twin ideologies of speciesism and carnism. The two features reflect and reproduce discourses that promote the oppression of non-humans. By contrast, the anti-speciesist and anti-carnist discourse, spearheaded by animal rights and welfare activists, is built around appeals to empathy, logic, and fairness, which are largely missing from the global media discourse. The media and the activist discourses appear to be speaking different languages. This presentation examines these two critical features of global media and proposes a solution to the standoff. If media substitutes one practice, that of protecting the twin ideologies of speciesism and carnism from being questioned with the practice of appealing to the reader's empathy and fairness, that will significantly improve media ethics by providing, quote, fair and comprehensive accounts of events and issues, end of quote, which is the explicit goal of journalism as described in the preamble to media code of ethics by the U.S. Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, our project was based on data so far from two global media news, uh, newspapers. One of them was uh, New York, the New York Times, the other El País. We are probably going to continue and include Arabic and also some Slavic newspapers along uh, this project. We used uh, the critical discourse analysis for our methodology because it an analyzes opaque as well as transparent uh, relationships of dominance and control as they are manifested in language. Um, basically, we want to make explicit what is not obvious on the first reading or the first hearing. And this emerging field in which critical animal studies converge with critical media studies has only been studied once by Kerry Freeman in 2009, who explored how American media, news media, construct animals in agriculture. Uh, we took uh, two years of our samples, included two years of coverage, and we focused on news and op-ed pieces. We had the similar uh, search terms for English and for Spanish, and we ended up with um, uh, 40,000 hits from the New York Times and 10,000 hits from El País. <coughs> Unfortunately, a lot of these hits were false hits where uh, they did not fit our criteria. Our criteria was to um, 
basically look at articles that uh, described in relevant ways live animals, uh, maybe raising cows, animal rights, activism, hunting, regulation, etc. And we excluded uh, articles about animal agriculture, which did not describe um, animals in their life state, or did not describe them in relevant ways, just mentioned them. And so we ended up with um, uh, 141 and 127 articles that were really, really uh, very descriptive, and we chose from, from these 30 for our sample, uh, and we looked at that. Uh, our hypothesis was that uh, we had three of them, uh, that news media coverage reinforces speciesism, that even when it uh, um, questions the status quo, speciesism is not questioned, and also that there are substantial differences between these global media. And the most interesting finding that we have was not that there is speciesism, I think this is uh, among our community a common knowledge, but how different these two newspapers were and uh, what really were the sources of these differences. When we analyzed our two samples, we discovered that subtle and explicit fear-mongering was the dominant strategy in a staggering number of our articles. The appeal to fear came through strongly in articles addressing the topic of regulation, regulation uh, towards animal agriculture. The one most addressed topic in our sample, 37% of all articles with LPEs, 40% the New York Times, a little bit less, 33%. On the other hand, in both samples, whatever the topic, the dominant frame, which means the main perspective used to explain the topic, uh, was business mainly as profit, utility, costs, benefits, and damages. The strategies we found used in the context of these types of articles, appeal to fear being at the top, are typical for what can be termed crude or old-style speciesism. Crude speciesism is basically the neglect or the outright denial that non-human suffering exists. It uses commodifying uh, non-human animals, objectifying them, failing to show their perspective. It um, uh, sanctions carnism, makes it natural, uh, it presents false dichotomies, us versus them, and it uses a variety of strategies of which I will give you shortly a few examples. For example, a lot of the choices in these articles um, were very negative, such as negative impact on the pocket, uh, which basically uh, foregrounds human suffering, monetary suffering or human emotional suffering, such as these animals, these chickens, pit uh, neighbor against neighbor. Or humans were portrayed as victims of non-human animals, uh, such as uh, pigs uh, described as eating machines, or pests, or menace. Another strategy, that of objectification, is when animals were described as objects, such as in this case, she saw chickens more as an outdoor activity and teaching tool for her kids. Um, also, uh, when they were described as invasive, spe invasive species, such as alternatively called wild boars and feral swine, the pigs are not the gentle pink cousins of Wilbur from Charlotte's Web. They are the most destructive mammal out there. They rot till the planet. Perhaps then the pig would grasp the horror of what its species had, had done. Uh, their only redeeming trait is that they are delicious, which was why Sonny took me out for the kill. So this basically shows that suppressing the reality that we are the ones to blame for non-human animals becoming a problem in the environment is really uh, used in the media. Another strategy of crude speciesism um, is using uh, certain um, types of names, um, which basically reinforces these hypotheses that uh, we started with. Yes, speciesism is reinforced. There is no substantial change since Freeman. Freeman and uh, no, uh, speciesism is not challenged even when the status quo uh, is, is challenged. Um, crude speciesism, as the neglect or denial of non-human suffering, is used in both papers, uh, New York Times and El País, but it is the only strategy in El País. There is almost no other type of uh, speciesism there. Contrary to our expectations, Spain's health-conscious Mediterranean diet does not correlate with a heightened awareness of animal suffering. For example, LPEs uses collective or objectifying names almost exclusively to refer to non-human animals, such as herd, um, or names that uh, reveal function uh, to, uh, to humans um, that animals uh, serve, animals to be fattened. 
or other objectifying names such as what we eat or numero AS22704. Our third hypothesis, the basis, uh, the, the difference in global media is what I'm going to focus on um, right now. So by contrast, New York Times approaches um, the non-humans, non-human suffering from both the perspective of crude and camouflaged or new style speciesism. Uh, camouflage speciesism is portraying animal agriculture as an industry with an ethical face. This is not the old crude speciesism. It is absent in the uh, LPE sample for the most part. We believe the explanation lies in the lower level of activism in Spain. Because of American activism, there is more conversation about animal suffering in the US than in Spain. Such conversation is seen as a threat to crude speciesism and media is recalibrating its approach by producing stories framed as happy promotional pieces. Um, like how we should praise McDonald's for regulation, as in this article, oh my gee, McDonald's does the right thing. Or how humane alternative agriculture is, as in the article where cows are happy and food is healthy. In fact, alternative agriculture is the second most addressed topic in the New York sample, 27% of all uh, articles. In stories about alternative agriculture, such as organic cow farming or backyard chicken coops, New York Times uses the tactic of bait and switch to represent non-human animals. Authors bring the tradition of naming non-humans the bait as a plus to the story, typically in an attempt to portray alternative animal farming as humane in comparison with factory farming. The protocol differs, however. Unlike humans, who are mentioned by their given and family names, non-humans only get one name, usually a nickname. In addition to names, to portray humans as individuals, articles describe them by their appearance, emotions, hopes, and struggles. Articles would bait readers by calling non-humans by a personal name, thus leading them to believe that uh, they are portrayed as individuals, like humans, but then would turn a switch and end it here, as in this example. I know most of my cows both by the head and by the <coughs> other. You learn to recognize them from both directions. Uh, no other characteristics are portrayed of non-humans. The bait is also used to imply that if a non-human is mentioned by name, their feelings are automatically considered and that they are happy as in this uh, example, the next time you drink an Organic Valley glass of milk, it might have come from one of Bob's cows. If so, you can bet it was a happy cow, and it has a name. Combining the boast that Bob's cows are considered individuals with the impersonal neuter pronoun it does not bother the writer. Rather than portraying young humans as subjects, camouflaged uh, speciesism ensures that the farmer's own subjectivity as humane is upheld. With these examples, we are implying that as speciesism is being challenged, it is also being confirmed and the readers are reassured that things are not changing, that the ethics of the industry is only skin deep. Most personal names given to non-humans in New York Times are nicknames that signify food, plants, or objects used by humans, such as peaches, pesto, pasta, hazel, costa, kimona. Kimona is the translucent blouse. It is also a name of a movie about a prostitute. Such personal names uh, are assumed to portray non-humans as individuals, yet pasta and pesto are fungible products. In fact, these names are akin to naming non-humans as if they were products, and that actually happens, grass-fed uh, beef, or just grass-fed without the noun, or beef master, his family's breeds, or just simply what we eat. Non-human names are rooted in consumer capitalism. For example, the amalgam Envirapig is a swine that has been genetically modified to excrete less phosphorus, while the haplologized name Aquadvantage salmon is a salmon that grows twice as fast. When non-humans are named using product and brand name protocols, they lose their individuality to a label. Non-humans are usually not described beyond the nickname such as kimona. However, when they are called by a product or brand name, they get a lengthy description, as in Bob rattled off her specs. Uh, and so we hear about the specs. 
or minimum input type cow with more depth of body, more thickness, good udder structure, and a good disposition. In order to promote, uh, promote alternative agriculture as humane and combat widespread attitude that it's for the crazies, camouflaged uh, speciesism creates the myth that non-humans are in control, as in uh, these examples, boss lady, a silver-laced wind of chicken, or SMS, I'm in heat, signed Swiss cow. It's also described, um, alternative uh, agriculture, it's described as a fun place, as fun employment. A place where you can do chicken voyeurism, as in the Tour du Cluck, where looky loose ogle non-human housing, such as the Coop Kibbutz, or Clucking of Palace, where chickens live. Uh, where you can also go uh, non-human as the politicians who, in order to be elected, need to get a I had the courage to cluck certificate. It does not certify that they are exploring non-human perspectives, clucking. It only certifies that they, that they ate a heaping plate of frittata. Um, another example, Portland birds, which basically means that they are too pampered. They are described as an extension of Portlandia, the 2011 U.S. satirical TV series that foregrounds ridiculous uh, obsession with healthy food and human footprint uh, on, the, on the environment. It's basically a type of a locavore movement, a quote, locavore uh, movement that has city dwellers moving ever closer to their food, unquote, and the food is the chicken and their eggs. Uh, but the message is that it is um, over the board humane. So the solution, uh, as uh, taken from another uh, article, is uh, don't pamper them so much because they're too pampered. Unlike some moms, I don't spoil my chickens. I give them uh, the leftovers of what I use for digestive quince, which is quinces in vodka. There is also the special case, and only in the New York Times, of uh, old age, which is 10% of all articles talk about old age. Um, for example, you know, when the cow Jolly grew old and unproductive, he basically traded her in for a piece of ham uh, because he's not running a charity hostel. And uh, of course, he realizes that when cows grow old and unproductive, they have to be slaughtered, but he's really, he finds this very tough. And so he uses the older cows to suckle steers. So he finds other uses of geriatric, so-called geriatric cows. Uh, their day of reckoning in this case can be postponed indefinitely in the case of his favorite cows. But, of course, the writer teases Bob about running a bovine retirement home. And with all these euphemistic, all that euphemistic language, basically, they're building the case that geriatric non-human animals have it too good. Or the case of senior birds, as they call them. Um, there is a class that you can take. Uh, to teach you about uh, end-of-life issues for chickens because farmers have to plan for a wholesome end of their chickens. And what is a wholesome end? Well, you basically find, find other uses of these chickens, such as producing manure or etc., etc. Among these other uses, wholesome uses, is butchering techniques. So, speciesism and carnism are inherently unstable because they stand on shaky ground. They are questioned all the time. To survive these challenges, they have uh, been applying different survival techniques that change when the nature of the uh, ch ch challenges changes. The comparison between New York Times and El País shows that the twin ideologies are evolving. They are adding to the old style, crude uh, technique of fear mongering, new camouflage tactics such as bait and switch where um, that assume that there could be an inherently humane place where cows are happy and food is healthy, a place where we can still exploit and kill non-humans without tell feeling guilty. However, this is only on the cover. Once we open the book, we are reassured that humans will continue to be speciesist and carnism is not going away because the cows are the food. What um, we are implying is that speciesism has evolved into a more difficult to spot strategy of emotional reassurance and comfort that are beyond, um, that we are beyond speci speciesism. We have evolved beyond speciesism, which is a tactic akin to the they race of um, To conclude, there are 
uh, there's, there was one article in the New York Times which talked about vegan bed and breakfast sanctuaries, and it did include representations of non-humans as subjects, as individuals, and they were very thoughtful. And so our main suggestion for a more responsible journalism is for journalists to question media's role in protecting the twin ideologies as one journalist did in this uh, particular uh, article, and also to include a perspective based on empathy and telling everyone's story, including that of non-humans. Fair writing should exclude crude and camouflage speciesism and carnism, or at least journalism uh, should not use euphemisms to cover these up. Empathetic writing should not coddle readers, like the joke about the New York Times suggests. Empathy should not be confused with comforting lies. Empathy allows readers to fully understand, feel, and to be able to emotionally process a true story. Therefore, we encourage journalists to write in ways that are more objective, um, that is minimizing or eliminating euphemism, also more fair, meaning accurately represent non-humans' interests, and also more empathetic, meaning appealing to the reader's desire for truth over reinfor reinforcement of crude cultural myths, such as speciesism and carnism, even if the readers subscribe to those myths. Thank you. So let me address your question or your comment on, on brain size. Uh, one of the topics, there, there's a lot of material I haven't covered, and actually I have all of this written in an article uh, that's uh, waiting for publication. So one of the topics I didn't discuss is actually, as you say, the, the size of the brain as a, as a uh, bad indication of the intelligence of the animal. When we look at the, the size of um, the Neanderthal brain, compared to the size of Cro-Magnon or uh, earlier brains. There's no indication that that um, means greater intelligence. If you look at the European brain, uh, the size of a modern human in, in Europe, uh, the size of their brain, and you look at the size of the brain of uh, someone in Asia or Africa, you'll find the European brain is larger, on average. But nobody defends the idea that Europeans are smarter. In fact, uh, Albert Einstein had a smaller than average size brain, and he's one of the geniuses of our age. Uh, the same thing with men and women. Men have tend to have a larger brain than women, but who would defend the idea that men tend to be smarter than women, right? And so there's a there's a misunderstanding about the importance of that, and that's one of the criticisms of the expensive tissue hypothesis that I find very compelling. Because if you take the fat out of the brain, the brain didn't grow nearly as much as it was assumed. And so these researchers, they're very focused on their area of expertise. But they're very hesitant, it seems to me, they're very hesitant to step out of their expertise. Uh, this is uh, using a biased sample, uh, which means that they only consider those facts that really support their hypothesis, and they tend to overlook other facts, whether that's intentional or not, I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, and then otherwise, generally, just as a speciesist issue, what does the brain size matter anyway? What, how, how does it matter to any animal? if? If brain size mattered, then shouldn't we be putting elephants and whales like at, at the very top, right? Because their brains are very large. Or if you want to look at relative brain size, there's a fish called the elephant nose fish whose brain, relatively speaking, is three times larger than a human's brain. But we don't, 
when these truths are inconvenient to us, we overlook them, and only when we have the advantage do we say, hey, look, humans have a large brain. So, thank you. Um, this is for Matthew, the last uh, part. I was just curious as to whether you had presented um, any of your findings to those newspapers, either of them, and if so, what reaction they had? Can you repeat the question? I, I was wondering whether you'd presented any of your findings to the two newspapers that you oh. looked at. We are still in the very early stages of actually uh, thinking through that, and I had to um, create um, that whole presentation just for, for here. And we're in the process of uh, writing a paper. We also intend, so in, intend this to not only be a paper that is published somewhere and not looked at by journalists, uh, journalists because this is basically, we have recommendations for them, and we would like them to, to look at them. And we also would like them to um, look at our recommendations with an open mind. And so we have to be very careful how to how we're going to write this paper. Uh, we intend to send uh, a, a, um, a copy of our work to every single journalist that uh, has a paper, has an article uh, in our sample. We could send it, um, our paper to them personally because they are available uh, as contributors to both the newspapers. And so we do intend to actually have um, one foot in academia and the other in the world that does not involve uh, just academic uh, publishing and academic writing. And we are hoping with this to be able to have, uh, to, to, to make some changes, to, at least to inspire changes, because um, one thing that I noticed is that in the New York Times, they are starting to actually battle with exactly these issues about speciesism and the amount of speciesism that is allowed and is not allowed to be um, revealed in the newspaper. And so I think that this is going to be a really interesting uh, thing to observe and see what is going to happen um, afterwards.